Crafting a sequel is a difficult thing. There's a fine balance between familiarity and creativity, to continue the themes and narrative of the previous material, while at the same time letting this new material be a platform for new ideas. Sometimes a sequel can give the creators a chance to expand on their previous efforts, or perhaps recontextualise their work from a new perspective. Sometimes sequels are a matter of artistic statement, but most of the time it's a matter of business. Following the success of the Nintendo Entertainment System, there was no denying that the Big N would look to continue its success into the next decade. It did take some time to get things started, and took the success of the TurboGrafx-16 and the Sega Mega Drive to challenge their position as leaders in the home market. The Super Nintendo released in 1990 in the Japanese market, and while it may not have ushered in the era of the 16-bit processor, it certainly did a lot to make it fondly remembered. Established franchises were back, with improved presentation and more sophisticated gameplay, not to mention new and exciting ideas that got their start on the Super Nintendo. Depending who you ask, there's a lot of factors to the console's design that made it something special, whether it was its rich soundscape, thanks to the power of Sony's custom audio processor, that used sample audio to create more vivid music and sound effects, its graphical capabilities, with tricks such as Mode 7, a graphical mode that allowed a background layer to be rotated and scaled in full 3D space, or the SuperFX chip, a cartridge co-processor that could produce legitimate 3D polygons. The controller itself certainly set the convention for what would later be iterated on in coming years, with four face buttons and shoulder buttons becoming standardised features, as well as a more ergonomic shape. Yet, all these features are in service of the games, and the games in particular are not only some of the best of the era, but might be some of the finest titles produced by their developers. As something of a swan song to the two-dimensional age of games, at least in the home console market, the Super Nintendo certainly shows the capabilities of seasoned developers working within the restrictions of the console's design, before the proliferation of polygonal graphics. But what games in particular represent how the console changed over the course of its lifespan, where developers moved from expanding on established ideas into creating new and bold ones that would be the template for future 3D games. Fortunately, with the release of the SNES Classic Mini, itself a sequel to last year's must-have NES Classic Mini, Nintendo have handpicked 21 games to represent a slice of the console's most popular titles, taken from across the five-year period of the console's reign. Not just a greatest hits collection, but a window into the creative in-between period of the fresh start of the NES era and the mainstream explosion of the PlayStation era. In honour of its release, and going in chronological order, well, I'm James D, and here's a series of mini-essays for the Super Nintendo Mini, starting with... The console can live and die on the success of its launch window, and it's fortunate that the first year of the Super Nintendo didn't just produce games that could sell the system, but would become unprecedented classics years after release. A slew of strong third party offerings did a lot to show why the console had improved over its predecessor. With Capcom's Super Ghouls and Ghost, and Konami's Super Castlevania 4 and Contra 3 being titles that massively improved over the presentation of their NES counterparts. Sprites were more detailed, new special effects could be put to good use, music was fuller and more polyphonic, and your modes of engagement were certainly better expanded than what could be achieved with two buttons and a D-pad. Of course, these titles were still very much in the mode of their arcade sensibilities, with difficulty that unfortunately cut me down to size. However, if there's one thing that can be said about these games, it's that they maintain familiarity. Franchises born in previous generations, but improved on modern hardware. Nintendo very much followed this formula, with one of the first titles produced for the system. As one of the original launch titles for the Super Nintendo, Super Mario World is familiar fare for fans coming over from the NES. As Nintendo's most popular mascot, and at the time, the golden boy of video games himself. A Mario game for the Super Nintendo was always going to be an obvious inclusion, as was bringing over what people loved about the previous games. The formula remains relatively unchanged from what was established in Super Mario Bros. 3, 
Levels are linear obstacle courses with unique challenges, but your goal is always to make it to the end of the level. This structure has always been a solid template for developers to be creative with what they can do by level. And with new power-ups, enemy behaviours and platform types, each level bursts with creativity and challenge that entices you to keep playing, if only to see what the developers might come up with next. This formula is perhaps that it's most honed in this game, and I would happily call Super Mario World my favourite 2D game of the franchise. One small change that gives the game a bit more playability is the inclusion of secret exits, hidden in red levels off the beaten track, that ask you to be a little creative in your route finding. This not only opens shortcuts between worlds, but even opens up entirely new sections of the game, something that Mario games hadn't really experimented with at the time, or have really returned to since. A shame really, as this feature only adds to the surprise you feel from seeing new ideas in play. Music is bright and breezy, and a perfect fit for the gameplay, and graphics have a cute and almost goofy aesthetic to them that matches the harmless fun of the Mario world. Overall, despite its familiar trappings, the game is consistent in its surprises, and particularly set the standard for future Mario games. Even it does have a few wrinkles that they didn't quite carry over into future titles. However, as a technical showcase for the console, it didn't do a lot to challenge the performance of the competition, nor show off any of the Super Nintendo's more unique features. Which is where the second launch title comes in. Racing games weren't a new thing on home consoles, nor were they new to Nintendo, but none made quite the same impression as the original F-Zero, a white knuckle thrill ride that felt faster than anything on the competing hardware at the time. It used the system's new capabilities to create a game that wouldn't have been possible before. A perfect mix of new ideas and restrictions giving way to unique circumstances. For example, the future shock aesthetic in particular, coming from having the vehicles drawn without tyres to keep memory low, and cityscapes rendered below the track to give a look of races taking place hundreds of feet in the air. The tracks themselves are sprawling straights and curves drawn in by the system's Mode 7 capabilities, with no performance hits despite how fast it runs. The speed in handling is just one facet of its appeal, but a unique stipulation to its design is the survival aspect. The sides of the tracks are dressed in electric barriers that sap away at your health bar, as does crashing into passing opponents. Charging stations can be found just off the main race line, and like Formula 1, it's necessary to balance your stamina with speed in order to maintain pole position. F-Zero aesthetically and mechanically feels very different to what Nintendo set out to achieve with Super Mario World, tasting like a sharp splash of Tabasco versus the ice cream fun of Mario's adventures. It's perhaps why the game still maintains appeal with the more long-time fans of Nintendo work and more hardcore players in general, and why the series received entries up until the Wii. But it's surprising that, as my first time playing the title properly, that the game still feels incredibly satisfying to play, with controls that are tight without being too squirrely, and speed that has to be played with to avoid crashing out completely. For Nintendo's first new franchise on the Super Nintendo, I hope it might get a second appreciation on the SNES Classic Mini. The following year of the Super Nintendo's release would be the start of seeing innovation coming to the forefront. Titles weren't just recycling old ideas and giving them an improved presentation, but in some cases were making meaningful improvements to their gameplay, if not outright reinventing them altogether. Capcom's Street Fighter 2 Turbo is perhaps a perfect example of this, having taken the bland and obtuse presentation and combat of the original Street Fighter and rebuilding it to become the idealised fighting game that all of us have inspired to be. If there's one game in particular that perhaps exemplifies how solid foundations can be improved upon, you only have to look at one of Nintendo's finest games. There's much debate around the best title in the Zelda franchise. The enormous success of Ocarina of Time certainly did a lot to push the medium forward, 
though its sequel, Majora's Mask, took this base game and gave it a much stronger narrative focus. Wind Waker and Twilight Princess used the improved performance of their hardware to make games larger and more sophisticated than these N64 titles, and were met with equal praise because of it. Then of course you have this year's Breath of the Wild, with its open air design and non-linear problem solving that has captured the hearts and minds of players worldwide. But all these games have a common ancestor, one that wrote the formula the Zelda games have followed since. A Link to the Past takes the lessons learned from the two previous NES games and applies them to a much more confident sequel. The viewpoint is once again a top-down perspective, and Magic and Combat see a return but in a much more streamlined fashion. Overworlds and Dungeons are once again the call and response to gameplay, though in this game the separation is more solidified. The Overworld is a free-roaming sandbox with plenty of activities to engage with and places to explore. And Nintendo made a particular focus on making it feel more lively and real with towns and characters that occupied its landscapes. Dungeons on the other hand are puzzle boxes to be solved room by room, with a formula that asks you to solve the dungeon to find an item, and then use that item to recontextualise the dungeon to solve it again in order to fight its guardian. The game splits itself pretty evenly between overworld and dungeon gameplay, and makes the call and response more noticeable. Items from the overworld are used to reach dungeons, and items from the dungeons can be used to expand more of the overworld. That's even before the introduction of the dark world mechanic, which adds an additional layer of traversal between the normal overworld and dungeons. In this game, story and presentation became a more important facet, and its improved look and sound is certainly appreciated. But its lasting appeal will certainly be in how it locked in the Zelda formula so early on, and returning to it, its simplicity is certainly appreciated, even if it does retain the cryptic nature of the NES original in some aspects. Of course, it wasn't just Nintendo who were reconsidering what an adventure game could look like on the Super Nintendo. Squaresoft's third-party output on the NES and the SNES are perhaps some of the most widely praised titles of their eras, though it's surprising that when it came to some North American releases, the RPG maker was a little apprehensive. The format was somewhat untested on the other side of the Pacific, and the cost of translating text and reprogramming titles to properly display English characters certainly was a prime matter on the developer. So. Following the success of the Game Boy Final Fantasy Adventure titles, the follow-up game was one of the few titles that made its way stateside. Perhaps one of the most defining features of Secret of Mana is just how different it is to the games that define Squaresoft's output both at the time and since. Unlike the turn-based combat of a Final Fantasy title, Secret of Mana instead has a real-time battle system more akin to The Legend of Zelda. Though, it does still include a stamina management system that delays the time between a follow-up successful attack, not to mention a push for levelling your characters. You have a number of weapons to choose from, all with different stats and mechanical differences. Unlike Final Fantasy, you can have more than one party member in a battle, with the computer in charge of their actions, or an option for a second player to hop in and take control. The game successfully splits the difference between the systems of Final Fantasy and the accessibility of The Legend of Zelda, to create a title that's the best of what the RPG genre can offer. The ability for multiplayer in particular gives it an almost Dungeons and Dragons-like quirk for collaboration in story crafting. Somewhat unique to other Squaresoft games, especially on reflection, is the theming of the story itself. In the beginning, Secret of Mana almost has a fairy tale like quality to it, from its world building introduction, its young protagonists, and even the simplicity of its antagonists. The presentation certainly matches this, with cutesy enemy designs and bubbly music tracks that perfectly fits the mood of its lighter story and setting. There's no RPG quite like Secret of Mana, whether it's gameplay, multiplayer, or presentation and it certainly stands as a pretty excellent anomaly in Square's catalogue, one which I'd be keen to see them revisit down the line. If there's a franchise that might rival the mainline Mario games in popularity, 
and is probably the Mario Kart series. Some of the best selling titles on every console they appear on. There's definitely an innate appeal to Mario Kart that gets people's attention. And it's surprising, with this being my formal introduction to the game, that this appeal is there at the formation of this franchise. So what exactly is that special something about Super Mario Kart that makes it more than just a Mario racing game? For a start, the simplicity of its controls are to be commended, maintaining the tight turns of F-Zero without the super speed, and the addition of a hop and power slide for more advanced manoeuvres. Power-ups are an inspired carryover from the mainline Mario games, and they do a lot to add an extra layer of chaos to battles that can turn the tide in your favour. But it's the tracks that make Mario Kart more than just the average racing game, channeling the same imagination the obstacle course of the mainline Mario game does. Despite the flat nature of its Mode 7 driven maps, each circuit in Super Mario Kart is chock full of fun ideas that gives each race its own identity. Despite its flat design, Super Mario Kart is as exciting as its 3D follow-ons, and is perhaps one of the best new franchises to come out of the Super Nintendo era. A list that includes... Star Fox is one of those games that wouldn't have been possible in the original NES. In fact, it's not actually possible on a standard Super NES. The poster child of the Super FX chip, a graphical support unit that interfaced with the console through the cartridge itself, Star Fox was one of the first true 3D games on the home market, years before Nintendo and its competitors made it the backbone of new home consoles. In that case, you'd think that Star Fox was nothing more than a tech demo with a high score system staple to it with simple polygonal spaceships and objects, and a performance that barely manages to meet double digit frames per second. But here's the thing, as someone who's never played the original titles before, I totally fell head over heels for Star Fox. A side-scrolling shooter presented from either behind your ship or from its cockpit view, with a constant forward momentum and two planes of movement maps your D-pad, the game feels incredibly fluid despite its performance struggles. Engaging with enemies and obstacles in the environment is a matter of hammering the cannons and performing invasive manoeuvres, all mapped to simple button presses that don't require any more excessive commands. The game is unashamedly arcade-like, and this simplicity only made its mechanics age wonderfully where its presentation has suffered. Like all great Nintendo titles, each level is a hotbed for new ideas. Whether it's new enemy or obstacle types, interesting boss battles, or environmental designs. It's amazing despite its look just how many ideas are in this game. And despite its short length, its high score driven nature and multiple path design means that there's much more to do after your first run through. It says a lot that the characters and scenarios have remained memorable since, especially thanks to inclusions in Super Smash Bros but I'm taken aback by just how long it took me to appreciate this having only just played this original game. If there's any title that proves that good game design doesn't age despite poor presentation and performance, then Star Fox definitely fits the bill. This year in video games would be considered something of a wrapping up point for the 16-bit era, with the release of the 32X add-on for the Mega Drive from rival Sega, and marked by the release of the PlayStation in Japanese markets at the year's end. Yet, in this year, the Super Nintendo had matured to produce titles that pushed the hardware's capabilities to create games on the cutting edge of possibilities. Final Fantasy III's push for advanced presentation is perhaps one of its biggest selling points, from its lavish introduction that puts the console's special effects to good use, detailed environments and battle art, and music that manages to emulate the orchestral sound the series would make it staple. It helped too that this would be the game that would solidify the series' strength for storytelling, with a tale of rebellion told from the vantages of multiple protagonists. Of course, following on from free. It would take the release of Final Fantasy IV on the PlayStation for the games to really see mainstream success, 
something that has continued since, especially with the release of last year's Final Fantasy XII on Xbox One and PS4. Nintendo's own Donkey Kong Country, which you can see discussed in the link above or in the description, made the push for advanced graphics that were quite unlike anything seen before, and they gave the console another race in the hole in the face of its current and future competition. Even Super Punch Out, the follow up to the NES classic, improved significantly the presentation of the original. With characters that had more detail in their sprites and animations, voice clips and sound effects close to real world sources, and controls that, while not a full simulation of the sport, gave the user more choices to engage with the enemy. But if there was one place the console could excel, it was in being a hotbed for new ideas. Such as... The last Capcom inclusion in the SNES Classic Mini, but certainly not the last game the developer produced for the Super Nintendo, Mega Man X is something of a revolution for the franchise. Transforming Mega Man for a new era of consoles would take more than just an increase in detail, and fortunately, the developers took a chance on a much more sophisticated take on the character and his gameplay. Running and gunning in 8 obstacle courses to fight 8 guardians is still the conditions you keep to but in just how you achieve these goals and the obstacles you face are far more expanded than the original. It only takes an introduction to a war hop to realise that this Mega Man has much more movement options than he had previously, able to shoot off walls and stick to size of bottomless pits, not to mention give you some breathing room in hectic fights. An expanded arsenal of movement options also does a lot to make this Mega Man more interesting to control and give you more modes of engagement with the game. Levels are designed to make the most of these new abilities, and Challenge in particular asks you to be a little playful in what Mega Man's new moveset can achieve. Despite its more serious atmosphere, the game is a faithful update of Mega Man's design and world, with enemies and items that look like better rendered versions of their previous selves. But it's the soundtrack that benefits the most from this increase in performance power. Where the NES title's musical intentions were marred by chiptune sound of simple noise channels, Mega Man X produces some pretty rocking tunes with sampled electric guitars and hitting kicks, a fit for the Attitude Era of Mega Man. Mega Man X is perhaps one of the earliest examples of a great reboot, one that best exemplifies how a game can be improved with the power of a new system behind it. Metroid is a title that needs very little introduction. Having taken Super Mario Bros. side-scrolling interface and combined it with The Legend of Zelda's non-linear dungeon gameplay, wrapped up in a brooding science fiction aesthetic. For many, it's seen as the third pillar alongside these two former titles in Nintendo's armory, and it made sense that like Super Mario World and A Link to the Past, the Metroid sequel on the Super Nintendo would expand on previous titles not only in regards to its presentation and performance, but add meaningful expansion to its gameplay. As you are already probably aware, and like these two previous titles from Nintendo, Super Metroid isn't just perhaps the finest game in its franchise, but it set the template for what future Metroid games would look like. It's not just the new weapons, the new mobility options and the new enemies and bosses you encounter that makes the game better than its predecessors. Perhaps more importantly, is the world of the game itself. You only have to look at its dedicated speedrunning community to understand that Super Metroid's level design is its most killer aspect. Graphics and level building go hand in hand to create rooms that aren't just interesting to traverse, but are utterly memorable in their design. And for a game built for backtracking to previous areas with new abilities, remembering a room either by its interesting landmark or obstacle 
is a good way to ensure players will return to solve the problem later, without the need for waypoint markers or in-game hints. Building rooms with non-linear traversal in mind also means that, if it's a player's second or third time returning to the title, the remembering other entrance points to rooms opens up opportunity for shortcuts and sequence breaks, not to mention find the quickest route to the game's end point. The game only asks you to beat four bosses to face its final challenge, but how you do it can be totally within your hands, if you want to skip the support in place for first time players. Of course, this isn't to diminish Super Metroid's other qualities, which are as stellar as the best of the Super Nintendo's output. The soundtrack is made up of alien choruses, drum led electronica and space station ambience, to best set the mood for each section of the game. Graphics toe the line between grossly detailed and Nintendo's art for simple but strong designs, moving from its Giga influences to something almost comic book inspired. As an aside, I appreciate the game's inclusion for a controller remapper, only so I can adjust the scheme for my terrible playstyle. To say that Super Metroid is the best in the series is a bold statement, but its influence not only on its own franchise but future games is perhaps the sticking point of Super Metroid. The game that nearly every future Metroid inspired or Metroidvania title took its cues from. The last two years of the Super Nintendo saw the company prepare for the next generation of consoles, with their very own Nintendo 64 Prime for release the latter year. You would think, then, that games would perhaps be safe and conservative titles to sunset the console. But being Nintendo, they still had a few innovative titles to see out the system. Starting with... Nintendo has a knack for reinterpreting the franchises for new gameplay conventions. After all, Mario's malleability paved the way for Super Mario Kart, as well as another upcoming game on this list. But if there's one character in particular whose plastic nature applies to both itself and the game it inhabits, then it'd probably be Kirby. Kirby's Dream Course is another example of how laboratories ask him what could happen when their popular pink puffball is applied to another genre, with this game following on from Kirby's pinball on the Game Boy. As the name suggests, Dream Course is a golf game, but as a Kirby game, it streamlines the systems that would have been associated with a sports simulation title, and then adds additional wrinkles expected of a character. Your goal is as simple as pocketing Kirby under par, but the way you do so is by taking out enemies in the environment. Tomatoes are your currency for swings, and you regain them every time you take out an enemy or pocket the puffball. Controls are fortunately very simple to use. You can point Kirby around a 360 degree arc of movement, and can also choose between a driving hit or bouncing hearts. You tee up, apply power to the swing, and let Kirby do the rest. Like his platforming titles, certain enemies can gift Kirby with special abilities, and these can be used to extend your range, or cushion your movement, or pass through obstacles. Quite unlike anything else on the system, nor anything released since, Kirby's Dream Course is a perfect example of what happens when unconventional thinking is applied to game design. By taking a character and reinterpreting another genre, both for their quirks and the design of the previous games, you end up with a title that's in a league of its own. Unfortunately, one that's still incredibly fun to play with years later.
Another Howl Laboratories title, and one that's a much beloved cult classic. Earthbound is the quintessential JRPG, though not as you know it. Set in a pop culture passage of the United States, gripped by a strange phenomenon and presented through a bizarre and irreverent tone, Earthbound both looks and sounds quite unlike any other title on the system. In particular, the Super Nintendo sound chip and its sample based audio is used to create soundscapes made out of patchworks of motifs and jingles pulled from real world sources. The game hits the hallmarks of your standard JRPG. A young protagonist set out on an adventure to save the world from a threat much larger than themselves. But like the rest of the game, Earthbound has fun poking at these conventions. As my first time playing the title, I could immediately get an appreciation for why the game has resonated with so many. Both then and now, there's nothing quite like Earthbound. Its writing in particular feels totally unlike anything you'd expect Nintendo to produce, nor would find in another RPG game of its type. And despite its somewhat sardonic view on the conventions of the genre and American culture, the game itself is incredibly optimistic, with a friendly atmosphere that feels fitting for the viewpoint of the game's protagonists. So, why am I avoiding talking about the bulk of the gameplay, or using clips beyond the first hour of the game? To put it simply, Earthbound is the quintessential JRPG, including the gameplay that goes along with it. Menu based combat is once again your main mode of interface with the title, and like many of our RPGs of this era, the game feels obtuse and difficult once the prologue is over. As to be expected, in order to progress, dangerous enemies have to be cleared, but you cannot simply engage with them at your base stats. Instead, grinding through low level monsters is the only way to mechanically move forward. A tedious aside, and one that feels at odds with the atmosphere of the rest of the game. And perhaps that's why, well, without ruffling any feathers, I couldn't find myself getting into the game. In those moments that I was walking around through the starting city, talking with characters and seeing a window into their strange personalities, Earthbound really shines. But having to gate those interactions behind walls of grinding and menu based combat is a real dampener. Despite a setting and presentation that books the trend of JRPG tropes, it's a shame that the gameplay didn't do likewise. Yoshi's Island isn't what you would call a conventional follow-up to Super Mario World. Donkey Kong Country had set the standard for what platforming games and home console could achieve, and with the 3D era just a year away, the idea of a game coming out in between two launch titles, starring Super Mario as dinosaur sidekick no less, seems like a safe and somewhat uninspired decision for Nintendo to see out the system's legacy. Of course, Yoshi's Island is anything but conventional, and its rebellious streak might just make it one of a few perfect video games. It's a bold statement, but this puzzle platform game is perhaps the best title of the 2D era, and very much wrote the rulebook that 3D titles were play by in the next generation. It's not just the expanded movement options that makes Yoshi a more compelling character, though they certainly do add a few more wrinkles to the standard Mario formula but it's in how the developers designed the title around his unique quirks. By flipping around the central protagonists, the vulnerable and time-tracking Mario, with the invincible and easy-going Yoshi, levels aren't just obstacle courses to be conquered in the quickest time. Instead, they're mini-open worlds with multiple objectives to complete, at least if you're going for 100% completion. Red coins would see their debut in this title, and for the first time in the Mario franchise justify the inclusion of currency, outside of vestigial high score elements and the satisfaction of collecting debris. Five smiling flower heads are tokens that require a little exploration and investigation to find, and collecting all fives gives you a more likely percentage to carry on to a bonus level. But perhaps the most interesting third pillar to our 100% completion is star bits. As previously stated, Yoshi is something of an invulnerable protagonist, outside of bottomless pits. But should he take a hit, or not baby Mario from his perch? You're given a 10 second window to grab him before occurring a lost life, but by collecting star bits, you can expand your window to 30. Getting 100% completion then doesn't just ask you to scout for special flower heads and red coins, but also to avoid all potential damage that you may take. 
Like the best Nintendo games, each level is a unique puzzle box brimming with new ideas and gimmicks that surprise and delight even on replay. Bosses all put to good use the Super Nintendo special effects, and the game is full of tricks that not only puts the Super FX strip to work, but are a showcase of the system's capabilities. Graphic and sound haven't aged a day, both with a friendly and almost childlike aesthetic that's a perfect match for the more thoughtful but easygoing nature of the main game. For its time, and even today, it's hard to lobby any criticism against the title. As a total realisation of what could be achieved in a platforming game, Yoshi's Island flawlessly executes these ideas in a package that stands the test of time. Outside of the best Mario game, or even the best Nintendo game, is a title that stands as one of the few perfect titles ever conceived. RPG games might not be my favourite genre, but if I had to pick a few titles that I at least appreciate for doing something novel with conventions, well, Super Mario RPG would definitely be one of them. As previously mentioned, Nintendo have always had a knack for reinterpreting other genres through the lens of abilities or quirks of their characters, and collaborating with RPG giant Squaresoft, the two melded two of their most popular franchises together to create something wholly original. Turn-based combat battles are of course your main mode of gameplay, but a novel twist on the formula is in how much you can be an active participant in the battles. Timing your attacks or defensive moves correctly can dramatically change percentages in your favour, and unlike the passive experiences of queuing up attacks in the Final Fantasy game, this does a lot to keep you more engaged in the made mode of gameplay. Recreating Mario as an RPG protagonist is also something of an interesting proposition. The character's jumps are of course put to good use, both to engage battles, hit special blocks and even progress in the platform lane environments. But in an effort to expand his moveset, they brought back his hammer from the arcade Donkey Kong. A hard hitting melee attack that feels like the perfect horizontal take on his vertical attacks. It's no surprise that this game set the formula for how Mario would be portrayed in RPGs in future, both in Nintendo's own Paper Mario series, but also in the Mario Luigi series produced by team members responsible for this original game. But there's one thing in particular that I don't quite like about Super Mario RPG however, it's its presentation. Sound and music is absolutely stellar, with new renditions of classic themes as well as original tracks produced for this game that match the tone of the entire franchise. But graphics are a bit of a shocking reminder of what was the expectation for that era of the Super Nintendo. With Mario and the cast recreated in pre rendered CGI a la Donkey Kong Country. Though, the pseudo 3D look does at least match the more open environments necessary for the towns and dungeons of an RPG game. For what would be Nintendo and Square's first collaboration together, but the last for some significant time, Super Mario RPG is something of a good gateway for both fans of Mario or Final Fantasy to the other franchise as well as another excellent title to round out the last year of the Super Nintendo. One of the last games released for the Super Nintendo coming just as Nintendo and developers at large had migrated over to the Nintendo 64. Kirby Superstar is an absolute treat for system owners and fans of the pink puffball. Mini game collections weren't a new thing, but Kirby Superstar isn't so much a buffet of ideas as a curated collection of small and highly polished games that show what could be done with the formula of a Kirby title. As I'm already using a mini review format for the SNES Mini, Here's a small set of mini mini reviews for Kirby Superstar's mini game collection. Starting with a 
simplified remake of the original Kirby's Dream Land. This title is a shrunken down Kirby adventure, complete with everything you'd expect from the mainland titles, a perfect introduction to players of the franchise, or a cheap and cheerful time for returning fans. An original title, but one that doesn't stray too far from the formula. A new wrinkle to Kirby's copy abilities is Super Sarah's, the ability to make a helper character, based in design on the enemy you copied your powers from. They can be computer controlled, or, fitting a Super Nintendo's two player design, can be picked up by a partner. A solid game, and a bit more challenging than Spring Breeze. An open world exploration team that doesn't ask you to complete it like a conventional Kirby level. Instead, you're on a treasure hunt, with 60 trinkets hidden in the environment. This open structure puts some of the more puzzling elements of Kirby's design at the forefront, and is designed to be replayed for better scores and better times. Probably one of the most ambitious titles in the collection, and an idea worth revisiting. A narrative-driven tale that sees the Pink Puffball station assault on the flying battleship. Unlike a traditional Kirby title, a strict time limit pushes you to play quick and barrel through enemies and obstacles. Probably one of the hardest games of the collection, though one of the more enjoyable too, especially in regards to its presentation. As the name suggests, it's the sprint between Kirby and King Dedede not only to be the first across the finish line, but to consume the most treats along the way. There's three levels in total, and a Grand Prix mode that ties them both together. A fun and frantic game, perfect for two players. A quick draw game, where the quickest button pusher is the victor. Its aesthetic is a funny recurring theme of the title, with the main character and his cuddly cast of enemies presented in a very serious manner. Another solid minigame in the collection. Another timing based minigame, structured around a test of strength competition. Increase your power bar, line up your shot, and watch the chaos unfold. 10 out of 10. <sighs> As the title does see out of the Super Nintendo, Kirby Superstar perfectly encapsulates the console's appeal in a single cartridge, showing just how many ideas could be wrung out of established franchises, new technology and some unconventional thinking. As one of the final games on the SNES, it's easily one of the best, and shows just how ambitious developers could be with its technology. Well, at least that was until. A game that very few thought would see the light of day, let alone would see an official release for the console it was intended for, Star Fox 2 is perhaps one of the year's biggest surprises. Having originally been shelved just before release in order to save it from the competition of the PlayStation and Saturn, Star Fox 2 is an interesting look into just how much could have been achieved with the Super Nintendo's most advanced technology. So, how do you talk about a game out of time? Do you compare it to its contemporaries, or take into account what was possible in competing hardware, or even hold it under scrutiny of other titles released this year? I guess the more important question is, as a sequel to Star Fox, how does it improve over its predecessor? Like the original Star Fox, 2's gameplay has matured wonderfully in comparison to its presentation. The linear progression of the original has instead been replaced by a more open environment and design both in its levels and its structure. The level menu of the original has been replaced with a strategy layer that asks you to destroy bases and battleships, while at the same time defending corn areas overall health. It's not just losing lives that can occur a game over. If you don't take time to manage missiles and attacks on your home base, you can very quickly lose the game. This open-ended gameplay has also been applied to your engagements. Once again, you can switch between ship and cockpit views, and your ship always has a forward momentum, but the corridor level design of the first has been supplemented with more open world environments, with lock and key puzzles being your gates of progression. To match this need for a wider, more thoughtful gameplay, you can switch your R-Wing at any time into a walking configuration, and at this point the game transforms into a third person shooter. One, that for a game released in 1996, with the choppiest performance of the entire SNES mini lineup, feels incredibly smooth to play with. Even space combat takes this open approach, with dogfighting scenarios that aren't just cool to look at, but exhilarating to take part in. If there's one thing I could lobby a complaint against, compared to the original, levels are very samey depending on your mission type. Planets always ask you to destroy bases the same way, dogfights always play out in the same manner, and despite the randomly generated nature of the campaign, you'll be seeing a lot of motifs recycled on multiple playthroughs. However, if you can stomach a choppy performance and presentation that can be a little tough to look at, Star Fox 2's underlying gameplay is a revolution, 
and like the best sequels, meaningfully expands on what was done in the original game. Crafting a sequel is a difficult thing. There's the fine balance between familiarity and creativity, the chance to expand on previous efforts, or perhaps recontextualize work from a new perspective. A matter of artistic statement, or a matter of business. The Super Nintendo proves that the sequel shouldn't be pigeonholed to a single solution, and that a franchise doesn't just have to follow a linear path of improvement in its presentation, but can splinter off into new genres of games entirely. As my first full experience with a console, having only got a second-hand appreciation of its library on the Game Boy Advance, playing these games as they were intended to be played, not to mention in the order they were released, gave me an appreciation not just for how excellent they were at the time, but just how well they held up all these years later. Super by name, and by nature, perhaps one of Nintendo's finest consoles. Hello! Thank you for watching and listening. If you want to support the channel, or receive notifications of new videos, remember to press the subscribe button. If you want updates on future videos, or want to know a bit more about me, follow me on Twitter. And, if you'd like to leave any feedback, please leave a comment below. I try and respond to anything you post. And that's all for now. Talk to you soon.